All right. Thank you very much for uh, showing up tonight and agreeing to listen to the story a bit for my first slide. I just wanted to say a little bit about me, just that my name is Gary Sosa. I was born and raised in L.A., and I've been in uh, North County, specifically San Marcos, since 2004 when I uh, started teaching at Palomar College. I have been an ESL instructor for over 30 years in the U.S. and in Asia. Um, and uh, important, I do not speak or read Japanese. I don't think anyone in my family does either. Okay. Um, so I, I propose to Mitz to talk about my search for my Japanese roots, to talk about um, my uncles and my father's involvement in World War II, and also a little bit about uh, Japanese immigration to Mexico. It's quite an ambitious little um, uh, topics to cover. So maybe, you know, I'll, I'll do hit on a little of each of them. And maybe at the end, um, whatever comments you have or questions you have or discussion that we can just go into it from there, because I'm sure you all have some experiences that are interesting to share as well. Um, that, so, you know, why I was interested, you know, I grew up in a family that was mixed, but, you know, growing up in L.A. in the 60s and 70s, being different, it was not something that we focused on. We, I grew up in a homogeneous society in L.A., and most of my friends and family, you know, kind of identified with the Mexican culture. Um, but, you know, I could not deny who my father, what my father looked like, and my uncles. So this was, um, this is a picture of them, uh, my father on the left and his three brothers. And um, these are my aunts, uh, my three aunts on my father's side. So, you know, having family that looked like this and having cousins who had this certain look that, you know, of course, we always thought, we always knew we were part Japanese, but it was not, you know, it wasn't important. It's like some people say, yeah, I'm a part Italian. That's why I like pizza. And that, and that, it's not a, a, a concern. It's not, it doesn't influence their life. And so that's how it was for many years. Um, this is um, my grandfather, one of the few photos that we have of Yunezo. So his, um, this is him in, in the 20s. And, uh, um, he disappeared in the late 20s, so that's all we have of him. And that's why I think he disappeared from memory. He he disappeared in the late 20s, and so my grandmother remarried. So it, 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 being Japanese was just like a, a whisper. And the, I remember talking to my uncle, and he showed me this Western Union telegram from 1927 that my grandmother received, indicating that her husband had died. And it, it, this, is, this has been like a relic in the family. And it, I was given this old copy and I photocopied it. And no one knew what it meant, not really, but it was just kind of the only thing that we had. And um, I, I really never thought about it when I saw it when I was probably 13 or 14. And um, But it made a lot of difference as I grew older and was interested in finding out. So in 1995, my wife and I we moved to Austin, Texas. And while in Texas, I was while I was looking for a job, I was thinking, okay, what can I do with my free time? Ah, Austin, Texas is the capital of Texas, and my father was born in Texas, and his two sisters and a brother was born in Texas. So maybe I can find some information. So I went to the capital and paid ten bucks, and guess what? I found my my father's birth certificate. Never knew it, that he had one, never saw one. And here, it, here's what it said. It said, um, it said, Yonezo, it said, Yonezo Mashida. And, you know, Japanese, and his mother was, you know, Guadalupe Sosa, which my grandma, and um, that, uh, that, the father was Yonezo, was Yonezo um, Mashita, and my father was also called Yonezo Mashita. So that kind of blew my mind. I go, what? I thought, you know, the, we, we always thought we were called Masuda. You know, that was the, the family history that the last name was Masuda. I had an uncle who changed his name in the 70s to Masuda. And um, so I was intrigued. So I, I did... Um, some more searching of old material, looked through old records, and I saw, 
I was able to find my um, my father's uh, Social Security application form. And this is 1937, I believe, 1939. And his name he used was Ernest Masuda Sosa. I go, what? Okay. So the Masuda was the, was the, the, the uh, middle name. And so um, I did more digging. I asked around for family for old documents. And someone sent me this document. And actually, somebody said, Gary, our last name actually isn't Masuda. It is Wilson. And I go, what, Wilson? And they, they showed me this document from El Paso, which has, uh, it's my grandmother's um, wedding uh, certificate and, and her marriage to Mr. Ray Wilson and Miss Guadalupe Sosa. And, and so, again, all of these names kind of led me down this rabbit hole of finding out who, where did our family come from? What was our last name? Um, so through a lot of researching, I you know went to the LDS Center, the Latter-day Saint Center. And for those of you who are looking for genealogy, help, um, inspiration, they're a great center. So I went to the, uh, the one in Austin, Texas, and I got a lot of help. Uh, people who encouraged me think places to look questions to ask and um uh, somebody said well your your father came on a boat right and he says yeah so the boat is it was on this western union so the the boat's name was there right it's you know ss president per pierce so look it up and so i did look it up i and i found the date here uh july 12 27 found the passage of the boat and so i wrote the maritime records in washington dc and they sent me after many months of course the captain's log of the president pierce that showed the night where my grandfather who they called yoniji masuda that he was he had left los angeles in 1927 to go to yokohama presumably to see his family and uh, he committed suicide, or that's what they presume. He just disappeared. And so they searched the boat. He disappeared. So again, another family mystery. So this um, sent me down, again, another rabbit hole. Now I, now I need to find more. So I needed to find some Japanese connection. So um, I had a friend in Austin, Texas, who I played tennis with. His name was Kuichi Murata. He was a friend of he was the, the, actually the husband of one of the students I was teaching. And I was telling him the story and he says, I have a friend who works for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Tokyo. Let me see what he can do. And so uh, after a period of time that his friend uh, was able to show me, let's see if I can, my grandfather's passport application. This is the Japanese passport application that was done in, I believe, 1905 or 1906. Um, so this was another piece of edit evidence. I had it translated um, um, to help me understand this. And so my friend Koichi helped me. So I used all this information and I, I documented, I, I got my passport, my father's birth certificates, my, his brothers and sisters' birth certificates, and I made this big package and I sent it to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Tokyo saying, I am a relative of a Japanese citizen and please, can you give me some information? Because beforehand, I could not find anything because you had to prove that you had some Japanese connection to get any information. And finally, I was sent, um, this is the Koseki, which is a family record. And um, I, which I promptly hired a, um, tr a translator in Canada over the internet, which is a great tool for genealogists. And she translated for me, she found some names. Um, I wrote letters to a lot of these people and they were dead or they didn't respond. And finally, I, I was got in contact with my grandfather's nephew, his name, and this, this gentleman here, Etsuhiro Masuda, or Masuda Etsuhiro. So this is a photo he sent me. Um, so over a period of few years, we 
we corresponded and he's a, a very, he was a very unique, really hard to understand man. Um, we corresponded, um, he sent me information. He showed me photos that he had kept that my grandfather had sent to his family when back in the twenties. So he had photos of my father when he was a baby so that he was, he was the repository of the information. He was a, he was a, a unique man, um, with that because he, um, he, he was actually interested in the world. So a uh, long story short that um, in 2018, I was getting ready to go to Hong Kong to spend a year on a sabbatical. And my wife had an invitation to teach for a month in Japan. I thought, well, this is a great way to go visit this Uncle Etsuhiro because I hadn't heard from him a while. And I just wondered, oh, what, what's wrong? And uh, so we made a trip to um, to Japan, but before that, a friend had put me into contact with a TV company called TV Tokyo. They have a show called Why Did You Come to Japan? And my friend, actually, was my he's my CPA, who happens to be Japanese Mexican, is that he was on the TV show and TV. They, and they helped him and find they, his relative. So um, I ended up. Um, uh, making in contact with this TV show called TV Tokyo. Why did you come to Japan? They met us. They met my wife and I, and they took us to see to, to try to find Etsuhiro because that was that was their TV show to help us find. So they filmed us along the way. Um, they we found the home, my uncle's home. We couldn't find my uncle. Um, my uncle's home was white. Um, quite unusual. Um, this is, was the facade of his home. He actually made like a museum out of his home and uh, quite an eccentric man, but then we found nothing. And we were told by neighbors um, that the, the earthquake in Kumamoto had destroyed the home. My uncle had become ill and he was no longer available. Long story short, through the power of TV and persuading people to talk, and having interpreters, um, I met my uncle. He was, unfortunately, he was um, suffering from a variety of illnesses. He could not communicate very well, even in Japanese, but um, I was able to meet him. Um, I was able to meet uh, also a cousin who was not interested in all. You know, because you know, one of the things that one of the the things that people think and is that they find their family and their families go, oh, my long lost family. No, you know, <clears throat> other than Etsuhiro, no one else in the Masuda family wanted anything to do with me. They they they, they refused to answer my letter. My my translator called them from from Canada and they said, oh yeah yeah, I know I heard that story before, but I'm not interested. And they just hung up. They and so. This cousin here, he had no interest in in talking to me, but the TV camera came. Just, it was just like reality TV came into the work, and they called, "Hey, Masuda!" And, they, and then my cousin came out, and they, and he's looking at me and says, "This is your this is your family member." And and then the TV camera came, and he he wanted to shake my hand, smile, etc. So uh, I I I I really give a lot of kudos to this team that had followed me throughout Japan. Okay. That that's okay. I found my family. Um, now the second part. Um, so, so my uncles they, and my father they grew up in the 20s and 30s until when they were young men. World War II happened. Um, um, our name happened to be Sosa at the time, but it was not an official name. It was a name that my it was my grandmother's maiden name. And growing up in L.A., poor. Um, widowed mother, um, having a Japanese last name, living in the Vario in the uh, Mexican neighborhoods of Alameda Street near little, a little near um, Olivera Street area was not a good thing. So the kids made fun of my uncle and my aunt. So they used the last name Sosa to fit in better. It was just very informal. And um, so that's why we use Sosa. So they, um, during World War II, um, there was a infantry regiment known as the 442nd. I don't know some of you know about it or not, that they were an infantry regiment. They were the most de decorated regiment 
in um, military history, and they're mostly composed of second generation American soldiers or Nisei. And they, um, they fought mostly in Italy, southern France, and Germany. They wanted to keep them away from Asia because you never know, right? <laughs> um, so this is the backdrop. So my, um, my father and my, and my uh, uncles. So my father, Ernest Sosa, he was drafted. He spent a few months in the army, and then my mother said he hated it. They, they identified him as Caucasian or Mexican, and he was he was um, he left the army as he was. My other uncle Alfonso he joined the navy and he entered as you know a Caucasian Mexican man. He spent a war in an aircraft carrier and he left perfect with no flaw in his record. Uh, my uncle my uncle Fernando um, who he entered the army and he was identified as Japanese right from the beginning. I don't know exactly why, whether they. You know, I don't, I don't think any of my uncles, my father lied. They just say, you know, that's their name. That's, that, their name was Sosa. That's, that's all they knew. And um, so my uncle, Fernando, he was attached to the 442nd and spent the, the war in Italy fighting there. And he ended his career there as well. My uncle, Fernand, uh, my uncle um, uh, Frank, or Francisco, he joined the army as a, as a Mexican, as a Caucasian. He was sent to the Philippines. And while he was there, the FBI came after investigating him and outed him out as a Japanese. And um, they took away his gun. They gave him a bolt action gun instead of an automatic rifle. And they put him on KP for the rest of the war. And, but he was allowed to stay. Um, uh, my uncles uh, were, are very proud patriots. They loved the army. I don't know why they... Well, excuse me, my Uncle Frank, they, they treated him terribly, but he's, he was such a patriot. Um, just a little side note, this is my father back in the 20s, or back, probably back in the 40s, excuse me, back in the 40s. He used to carry around this card, <clears throat> like a, a free, free pass permit to show that, you know, who he was and that he was legit. I'm, I'm, I don't know a lot about this card. I just remember seeing it and photographing it many, many years ago that um, my uncles were part of a, a photo series uh, commissioned by, I think, Go For Broke, which is an organization that supports the, the memory of the 442nd. So I'm going to put this link in the chat just in case you're interested in looking at it. Um, it is an article where it, it talks about a book called Go For Broke. And in, in the first issue, this is the, the title cover, that it has my uncle, and it has my uncles. These are two of my um, uncles. Uncle Fernando, he just passed away a few months ago, and my uncle Frank, he passed away about three years ago, both in their mid-90s. And this is all the four uh, Masuda Sosa brothers. My father here is with the hat, and my uncle, the Navy man, and the other two brothers. So um, that was kind of um, their part in the war. My, my uncle Fernando, uh, that I'm going to put these links to. Um, he was part of a um, film that was created to talk about his his time in the 442nd and his memories. And it's kind of a touching film, so if you're ever interested, you can check these um, YouTube links out. It, um, this is with um, my uncle Fernando. Okay, that was, um, I'm just trying to, to leave us plenty of time to talk in case um, we want to talk about other things. Um, so for those of you who are interested in this, you know, in the Go For Broke uh, Center, um, this is the, the website, which I'll put in the link in the chat, excuse me. So they do have an education center. They have a, a memorial, a Go For Broke memorial that has all the names of the 442nd um, soldiers. And every year they have a gala to raise money and they do other activities to preserve the memory of um, the 442nd and the Japanese contribution to um, US effort during World War II. All right, so, okay. I'm sorry for going so fast, but I just wanna um, 
I'm, I'm not an expert in any of it. I just, these are just like personal research that I want to share with you. And hopefully there's, there's something interesting in it. So um, the whole thing made me think about, you know, you know, whenever I told this story for somebody, I go, what, Japanese in Mexico? What? You know, hey, Gary. I went, yes. Do you mind if we, we take a, a pause here and open it up for questions? I have a, a few questions. I'm trying to understand. So you had uh, your, uh, it was your dad and your three uncles. And they're all, they're, are they half Japanese blood? Half Japanese, half Japanese. Okay. And um, you talked about the different places that they all went. Did you also have aunts? Yes. The, the three, three ladies, the, the, yeah, three aunts. And so, they're half Japanese? Half Japanese as well. What happened to them during the war? Um, unknown. Unknown. Interesting. Unknown, that, that um, again, you know, one of the things that, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who do genealogy and, you know, there are some families who have a rich history, you know, they take, they have photographs, they have movies, they have written records and collect letters and maybe you have families like that. But my family was pretty poor and pretty uneducated. My father, I think, completed fifth or sixth grade along with, I'm sure, the rest of my aunts if they went that high. So but were they were they in California at the time? Yes, they were in California, oh. and and they none of them went to a camp. They I think yeah. having the, the the name Sosa was um, a godsend maybe for them. Yeah, that's it. It's really interesting because I thought that, and I forget the rule. If you're you know one eighth Japanese blood, you had to go to the camps. And so I'm really surprised that they didn't. The FBI didn't find. Uh, your aunts at all yeah um i don't know i mean they they I, I have photos of them from the 40s and they were you know they were out in the street you know uh they were not hiding and so um maybe this the name sosa maybe they all their um friends and people they surrounded themselves were all of you know latino and that was just that was their cover yeah, yeah that's that's really interesting okay thank you Maybe I should stop here too. Did anybody have a question? You say you have a family in Kumamoto? Yes. No, in in in, the, in Mizato City. Okay. Uh, ask because my dad and his family uh, are from Kumamoto. <laughs> so I used to go there all the time when I was. Oh. A kid. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, it was such a beautiful place. I'm I'm just dying to either retire and spend time to. Oh, uh, really? Or that. To explore that area, and yeah. cause it's um, uh, it's very rich, and I'm just curious to know because uh, my actually my um my grandfather and his brothers they were tofu makers. Okay. And um, I I love tofu, so um, <laughs> I'd love to to explore. You know, it's just filled with rice paddies and interesting hills and valleys, and so um, yeah. Yeah. What a coincidence! Yeah. Yeah, I guess I, um, I'm a little surprised that your relatives are so cold to you guys or to you. Um, you know, I have pretty distant relatives in Japan. I guess they're like my mom's cousins, I think, but um, they were very open um, when I reached out. They're like, hey, come visit us. Um, and I, it's just, it's surprising because I, I thought they would be a little bit more welcoming. I don't know if anybody else has tried to reach out to relatives in Japan uh, and what your experiences were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just curious too. You know, um, be before I knew there was anybody there, I knew uh, Mizato was the city. And so I was told that, you know, to, to write a letter, an open letter, to put a picture of my grandfather, myself, his aunts and uncles, and, and they put it on a community board somewhere in in Mizato City or in Kumamoto. Huh. Some, and and you know, the translator said, you can try it, but he says that people who live in small small towns are very mistrustful I, I, of people doing this. And you know why why do you want to find us? And so huh. um, um, when the translator called, actually my uncle Etsuhiro, he says, you know, you have a brother, you 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 Siji, you you Niji, you Niji. Where does he live? He says, oh, he lives next door. He says, oh, do you talk often? He says, last time we talked was two years ago. So. <laughs> okay. I see.
And so, you know, any romantic image of like, oh, he's here, he's here, we're going to share. That's like, so, so, you know, I, I know there is, there are more younger people, but it, it's challenging, you know, if you, when you don't speak Japanese and even accessing social media, you need Japanese to access, you know, Japanese social media. I don't have that right yet, you know, and um, so I know that there are younger Masudas out there and maybe they would love to shake my hand, but um, I, I don't yeah, have it could be. It, it might be a language barrier, especially if they don't know English, it would be hard for them to even imagine trying to communicate with you. So maybe that's the yeah. reason. You know, uh, I had a very similar experience uh, that, like Michael, my dad uh, found out oh, I'd say about 40 years after the war, that he had a cousin still alive in Hiroshima. Uh, never wow. met him. He thought they all died. And um, my dad worked here in San Diego for Kyocera. And um, uh, somebody from Kyocera was also from Hiroshima and says, you know, I know a Nishikawa over there. Um, let me reach out. And so he found out that it was his cousin. What? And wow. so they wrote to each other. And of course, my dad's going to visit. So he took my mom and uh, the story goes, he took two bottles of Johnny Walker Black Label as an omiyage so, uh, to visit. And he was going to give his cousin one and drink one while they're, you know, having a dinner. Uh, right. But when he gets off the train at Hiroshima, he sees four guys. They're four brothers. Four of his cousins are alive. And oh, wow. their mother, his aunt. And so uh, he says, well, I brought these two bottles for us to drink while we're here. So, uh, <laughs> of course, the next time he brought my sister and I at San Francisco airport, he says, I want you to pick up nine bottles of Johnny Walker Black Label because <laughs> we're going to be going to Hiroshima. And I go, nine That's bottles? Great. What are you going to do with nine bottles? Don't worry, just pick up nine bottles. So when we got there, uh, we went to the family home, and I found the story out. They told me why they were alive, because they lived on the other side of the mountain. And the mountain mm, wow. protected them in a small village outside of Hiroshima. And uh, so it was really great to kind of visit them and connect. And, of course, my Japanese is horrible. So they attached one of their daughters to my sister and I to translate for us the entire time we were there. But, um, yeah, I had a very uh, – uh, it was really – uh, fun experience, you know, so. Well, I, I, um, thank you for sharing your story. That's amazing. I always, I feel a little bit envious those people have those good endings or at least making a connection. Um, but, uh, for me, it was just fine, finally kind of demystifying the mystery. Okay. This is where we came from. There, there was a, uh, origin of our family and it was this guy Masuda Yonezo, and he came from a small town, and he went to Mexico when he was 15 years old, and how the hell he made it from southern Mexico to El Paso, married my, my Spanish-speaking only grandma, how they had seven kids and moved to L.A. I, you know, those are the mysteries that, that are amazing about immigration. It's just an you know, immigrant story, yeah. Any other questions I can answer? Or maybe some of you have comments or have similar experiences. Um, you were not able to find any information about your three aunties? No, my, my three aunties, they, they all passed away. No, I grew up with my aunties. So my uncles, my uncles, um, they all lived in LA. Everybody stayed in LA. Did they marry? Yes, they did marry. So I'm um, like, you know, all my, all my cousins, they kind of look like me. We, we go through life saying, okay, are you, are you Mexican or what are you? You know, so we all kind of have a, a certain look that everybody, you know, growing up, all my cousins were called, you know, some kind of all kinds of pejorative terms that, that we just rolled with it, right? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. So, you know, so the, one of the things that I always tell people is, gather as much information you can, especially these older people that they have letters, they have photographs, um, especially if they're not, if, if your family is not well off and they don't have like my cousins, my uncles, my aunts, my grandma, she, she was moving around, living in apartments, 
cardboard boxes getting wet, soiled, rat droppings in. So everything's not permanent. And so a lot of things never got preserved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so when, when, and whenever I do get a little piece of information, I go down to a cousin's house. Can, can, can I, can I take this right now? I'll go and scan it and I'll bring it right back. <laughs> Because I know that it's not that important. You know, I realize that for some people, all this history is not that important. It's important for them to say, yeah, I'm Japanese. I go to Little Tokyo. I have sushi with my friends. And they feel proud of that, but not deeper. And this, the deeper part is the difficult part, to, I think, sometimes. Um, I think it is. Um, it's, it's challenging because, um, you know, I have a cousin who's really interested in our past. And so he was digging through a lot of these documents and he found um, all of the material. I, I think my grandmother was in Kagoshima in Kyushu. Um, my grandfather went, got married for some reason with her. I think they, that's, they had set it up and he didn't know about it. Um, and then they went to Yokohama, but he, had the pa he found the paperwork that showed they were in Yokohama waiting for the visa. And then he got on the certain boat and, and was able to come over here, but everything was in Japanese. And luckily, you know, my wife, is not Japanese, but she speaks and writes Japanese. And so she was able to, to take that and, and say, hey, this is from Yokohama. They stayed three months in um, waiting for their visa. So she was able to um, translate everything for us. But I think for a lot of us on the Zoom, we don't have anybody that speaks or reads Japanese. And so it might be hard to get that information. Right. Yeah. I, at the beginning, I just paid uh, this translator. And, you know, I was I was happy to pay pay that money just to, you know, it was, it was it was a mystery, and, and I, I needed that information um, to help how, unlock. How did you find that person? Was there a service online, I guess? No, I, the first time I, I probably I found the translator probably in 2004, and um, I was at Palomar College, and I talked to a Japanese instructor, and she didn't she didn't want to translate. She just, she didn't think she was good, but she had a friend who lived in Canada. I see. And so she, so I got that number. And so I've been working with Naomi Baba for since that time. And actually, one of my my the person who served as my interpreter in Kumamoto, he he was an, my translator in Canada's good friend. So okay. she told me, you know what? Actually, I have a friend who you know, older man who lives in Kumamoto. He's kind of retired university professor. Maybe he he would help you. And so he went with us with the TV crew because the TV crew didn't speak English. And so he was my interpreter. And. Uh, you know, going into, uh, you know, Buddhist, uh, you know, temples to look for temple records. And, uh, you know, it's very, very, um, uh, the, the search of it is fascinating, even if the, the personal connections were not. <laughs> I, yeah, it's, and I'm, I'm sorry to keep talking, but it's so interesting. And I have connections now in Japan. Um, if you guys, <clears throat> if you ever end up in Japan, going back to where your grandparents came from. If you go to City Hall, you can ask for a family registry if you, if you know their names, and you might be able to get, so I got in, um, in Kagoshima, a family registry that goes back a thousand years. Um, and you can see you know, all of these names in, in your family registry. So if you have a chance to go back to Japan and uh, go back to your hometowns, you might be able to find uh, a lot of information like that. Did you have to show proof of relationship? Um, so we, yeah, we had relatives, and so they were able to get that. I, I see. I, I think that if, if you go and you explain why you're there, I have no idea. Hopefully they would be able to give you, um, give you the information. Yeah. But well, yeah, back to when I did this, it was, you know, again, 20 years ago, they, they didn't believe me. So they had, I had to show all this, <laughs> these documentation. The, the name going from Mashida to Masuda to Sosa and then, and then yep. an explanation. And, yep. And now that I think about it, in that family registry, I'm still in there. Um, I was like the last, the last generation to be put into the registry. And wow. so um, maybe that's what made it easier. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very amazing to me that you were able to, that you tracked down people that were Hosokawa, Mashita, Masuda, Wilson, Masuda again, and yet you ferreted out all this information. That's just, that's true diligence, I think. You know, I tell people, you know, you know that it, you just, it just has to be always on your mind. 
but sometimes you, you just go through a fallow period. Like for for many years, I was living in Taiwan, and I really couldn't do too much um, um, searching that way. You know, I and so those years were just kind of dead in terms of my genealogy search. But when I came back to the U.S., I would would be able to do some more search, and then I'd go somewhere else for a few years. I taught many years overseas, and so it, it took it took a while. And um, but um, it. It but has, you're persistent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I, and maybe you mentioned this, and this is maybe a too, it's too personal, but so you're a quarter Japanese, a quarter Mexican. What is your other half? So mo mostly is Mexican. You know, I did a, a, a ancestry, not a, or a, one of those um, DNA testing. And yep. so most of it, so it's like 20, 27, 28% in, you know, Japanese. And then most of it is, um, Indian or Mexican of from Southern Mexico, because my mother's my mother's family they they were from they were the Montoyas which were in New Mexico for many years and even before it was the U.S. Um, so yeah, and it, it sounds like you've embraced your Japanese side. Have you also done a lot of research on the on your Mexico slash native native side? You, you, you know you know one of the interesting things that I I found that you know is it, it's more of a challenge when you're dealing with incomplete records, especially, and I mentioned, you know, like poor families, they, mm -hmm. they don't keep records, you know, they have children and they don't take photos, they don't keep mementos, they don't keep dates, and, um, and families that move from apartment to apartment, you know, they don't accumulate all that, all those mementos and all those documents, documentation that is vital. So I always was envious when I met, you know, people who have, oh, I traced my family back to the Plymouth, you know, the, you know, pilgrims and, oh, you were so lucky, you know, because, you know, they kept records and Bibles and passed it down. And um, so my grandmother, she, I, she came from a city called Querétaro. I found her baptismal records to the um, Church of Latter-day Saints archives, but a lot of the archives are gone because of the revolution in 1910. And, you know, and so... She was she was an orphan, and so you know, just there is family out there, but you know, it's it takes time. That and, and I understand completely now. When I go to genealogy meetings when I was younger, everybody was old. Everybody was you know had gray hair, and you know they had retired. And I go, why are only old people interested? Ah, they have the time to do this work, and now I'm getting to that point where I you know have the time. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I, I'll, I think I'll just end with you know uh, just a brief. I, I don't. I'm I'm not a historian at all, but um, I was able to get this great um, uh, master's thesis um, called "The Japanese Immigrant Community in Mexico: Its History and Present," and the author is Chizuko Wanatabi, and she did her um, MA in anthropology. Cal State LA in 1983, and um, so I, I I just took some notes of some interesting things that I would share with you. So um, so a delegation of Japanese was sent to by Shogun Iyasu in 1610 to Mexico, um, the Nueva España, to open up trade negotiations. Um, um, also, in, in 1636, Jap Japan closed its door to the world through the isolation edict, violation of which was capital punishment. So, you know, J Japan was closed for many years. Um, the first organized uh, immigration to Hawaii was in 1868. And I think some of you probably have maybe Hawaiian roots, because that was a, a big um, place where uh, early immigrants went. Um, officially, immigration to Mexico did not start until 1887, um, which I found was interesting that Japanese immigration to Mexico was in part due to the, the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905, which kind of economically depressed Japan, um, and it caused probably my family to leave. So this is just a snippet of records. But in 1903, there was 346 Japanese who left for Mexico. In 1906, there was 5,068. In 1907, 3,822. 
in 1908 um, zero. Um, partly, I think the zero was um, in, in 1907, there was a gentleman's agreement between the US and Japan, which was an informal agreement that would that Japan would not send any immigrants to the US and the US would would hands off on on existing Japanese immigrants because during that time there was a lot of riots in California and, and Japanese were excluded and there was race riots and so um, so I think the immigration dried up into uh, Mexico in 1908. Um, what was interesting I found too, there was a quote um, from a Japanese immigrant at that time, Japan won the war, the Russo-Japan uh, uh, Russo war, but 60 million countrymen suffered from scarcity of food and economic depression. I was told that to immigrate to a foreign country was a way of showing my dedication to my country. And so I'd never, you know, I, you know, I've worked with ESL students and know quite a bit about different immigration patterns, but not this idea. Um, so immigration eased unemployment, population pressures, and brought in foreign money, which we understand, right? Um, so I, again, this idea of Japanese wanted to return home in golden brocades, which um, the author of this thesis said meant that, you know, basically you would come home in a suit, you know, you came home rich, and that, that idea. Um, so in 1897, uh, the Inomoto Imin was the first group of, from Japan to settle in the Chiapas region. Um, if you're not familiar with Chiapas region, um, this is in the bottom towards of the southern end of uh, Mexico on this peninsula near the Central America. Let's see if I can blow it up just a little bit. No, I can't. Yeah, so this is Chiapas. And so we also, they also settled in Oaxaca, this area of, so maybe from Japan, this was a good route. Um, so th th this name, uh, Onomoto, he was actually um, the prime minister of, of Japan, and he was real into promoting um, immigration. And after he be stopped being prime minister, he was really encouraging um, uh, immigration as a way to spread Japanese influence in the world. Um, so, at the, but at the same time, the Mexican government was encouraging foreign investment and immigration to their country. So this guy, Enomoto, he set up an immigration association of groups of Japanese to Mexico and to Southeast Asia. So the association in 1896, they bought a huge swath of land in Escuintila, Chiapas, and so they sent a group of Japanese there to to, to start uh, in agriculture. And because of the climate and their lack of experience of growing in a in a tropical environment, they failed. And so a lot of them went back home. Some of them stayed and took up other trades. Um, so a lot of the contract immigration um, took place during this time, where my my grandfather was involved. And some people were sent to work on railroads, and some people were sent to work in mines in northern Mexico. Um, that um, again, you know, if you ever do immigration um, genealogy research and you have limited resources, like I did, relying on any kind of friends, telling your story over and over again to as many people as you can, really helped. So my friend in Japan, Koichi, who I knew in Austin, Texas, I. When I went to Asia, I made sure to visit him because he's a really great guy, him and his wife and kids. And so Koichi, on his own, he contacted um, a Japanese journalist who did research on Japanese immigration to Mexico. And so he found this information all in Japanese. He translated it. And my friend Koichi contacted this journalist and got this information about my grandfather that my grandfather, Yunezo Masuda's name was on a file submitted to the Foreign Ministry of Japan by this company, who is one of the three companies that were sending um, immigrants to, um, to Mexico. He was on the ninth immigrant group. He departed in Yokohama on December 10th, 1906, mm -hmm. and he arrived in Salina Cruz, Oaxaca uh, in Mexico on January 23rd, 1907. So uh, a lot of them were, um, were supposed to work on the railroad, 
but by the time they got there, the railroad was finished. So it was kind of bait and switch, I think. And so they sent them to work in sugar plantations. But because of the revolution in 1910, a lot of the, a lot of the plantations closed down and the workers just dispersed all over. Again, you know, my, I found the first record of my grandfather in El Paso in 1915. So I found it on a registry. He was a clerk in a store. And so, um, again, genealogists in uh, New Mexico, uh, in uh, excuse me, Texas, helped me find his name. And so somehow between 1907 and 1915, he had made his way across the border, which was probably very porous at that time. He knew Spanish well because he wrote to my grandmother in Spanish. We have some letters that are preserved in his handwriting in Spanish, which was beautiful. And he managed to learn some English, I guess, because he was working in a retail store. So, um, you know, again, a lot of the Japanese ran away from their jobs because, you know, they wanted to go to the U.S. And um, their conditions were, were terrible in Mexico. And um, that's how that's as much as I know about how maybe some Japanese at that time got to the U.S. and entered. And as far as I knew, my grandfather did not have a passport. I couldn't find any records. Um, he, I did find a record. He did uh, sign up for selective service for World War I, so good for my grandfather. And it did say he was a Japanese citizen, but he did, he did sign up for selective service for World War I. Um, so basically, that's um, where um, I would like to end. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I'm... Japanese immigration to Peru, to other places, Southeast Asia must be as fascinating and mysterious as well. And I would, you know, love to spend more time to be able to dig into this, this part of our history. Um, um, does anybody have any comments or questions or like to share anything they know? Yes. Um, I had a, our friend who's not present. He mentioned to me at one point um, in um, that it's really interesting, the Japanese-Mexican migration to the United States, um, but also to that during World War One, too, that um, Mexico deported them to the United States so they could be put in concentration camps. Is that yeah. true? Yes. Peru did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ah. It's shameful, shameful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, I mean, looking at history is not pretty. You just have to look at it with uh, like a academic eye. The um, actually the FBI and the military, U.S. military, work with the governments to uh, arrest Peruvians, uh, South uh, Americans. And they were held in, I believe, Corpus Christi, Texas. Mm -hmm. And they were being held for prisoner exchange with Japan wow. because they could not do prisoner exchange with the Japanese Americans because they were U.S. citizens. Oh, wow. So, anyways. Oh, no, and thank you. If they were not Americans, but they were held in camps and prisons during the war, they were not um, allowed to get the $20,000 no. In the Actually, uh, JCL worked with uh, a couple of organizations to try and get redress and reparations for the Peruvian Japanese, uh, thus the one I know of, I don't know about Mexican Japanese, uh, that were held in camps. And they, they were, I think they were able to get something, but it wasn't as large as it was for what they were able to do for the Japanese Americans. I think partly because they weren't U.S. citizens. Yeah. Um, Normanetta talks about that, that. One of the things that he wished he could have uh, 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 maybe had a bigger hand in was do something for those, uh, those Japanese. Because what happened was, you know, they lost their uh, any kind of citizenship with Japan, any kind of maybe uh, citizenship they might have had with Peru, and they weren't U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. So uh, after the war, when they were released, they were kind of like, what are we going to do? And they couldn't go back home. They lost everything. They lost all their possessions. They lost all their businesses. The Peruvian government took it all. And so it was a, it was a very tough time for them. Did you um, teach any of the, the, this type of history or 
Uh, I've done a lot of research. Um, I did teach uh, over at, uh, in the in the Bay Area, San Francisco State University. I've taught at Stanford. I started at one of the UCs in uh, in Monterey, but um, mainly I do the research because I've written plays and I, I've written films, and so a lot of the research I do is to uh, to on the subjects of the World War II experience and. Okay. I tell you the stories when you're when you're when you're trying to find out one story, people share a lot of other stories with you, you know. Right, right. And so, uh, yeah, I've been doing that for a lot of years. So, you know, I'm going to take this opportunity to maybe ask you because I I belong to a group at Palmer College called the Pahi Asian Pacific Islanders in Higher Education. We're a very small group, um, but you know, Asian American history and is is fading away in at least at Palomar College and there's there were no courses we had a I had a specifically asked multicultural studies and to bring back these courses because basically they said that there, there was no one they had who could teach them so that's why they stopped offering them and um, yeah and so I you know I'd love to see people who are interested in it but you know that um, there we found out there's a lot of of Asian Americans but they're mixed so you know Colleges and companies, they count people like you identify. What are you white, you know, Asian and, and they tick the box. But we found out that um, there's a lot of people who say they're one thing Caucasian, but they're also Asian. They're black. They're also Asian or, or they're, you know, Mexican. They're also Asian. So the, at least in Palomar College, the biggest other person, other identity other than the one they put is Asian, but they're not counted. They're not so in the numbers you look at how many Asians in Palomar College you see it's such a small number, but it's not the true number. Um, well, you know, uh, I'll tell you a funny the thing is when I came here to San Diego, I didn't know what I was going to do, um, and so I thought, well, I taught before and I put out some uh, resumes and some off different. I, I never got a call. So uh, I think though, I think though that with what's going on now with all this Asian hate. And I think education is one of the things people talk about as a way to combat what is going on in this country. And I think um, anywhere that we can teach the history of Asians in this country, uh, I, I think is a plus. And it, and it, it takes just a little step because racism, they're not born with it, you know. And the more they can learn about other people's backgrounds, uh, the more that we can do, make, make one step further in combating what is going on today. Yeah, um, yeah I, I've, I've enjoyed, you know, um, sharing my story and also hearing your comments. And I would, um, I don't know if anybody else has, would like to share what you have experienced in looking at your own roots or, or have questions about how you would maybe go about it. Yes, Mitch. Hello, Peru. I'll just share a little story. Hello, Peru and Mexico, as we've talked about. I was talking to a lady from Honduras. She's elderly in a little residential care facility, and we got to talking. And she says that when she was growing up in, I don't know what town or city, there was a Japanese um, fellow who was running this big, I don't know what the industry was, uh, married to a local Honduran lady. And uh, the American soldiers arrested him and took him away. And she, she never saw her um, Japanese husband again, never came back to, to Honduras. Oh. Uh, now again, I don't know, you know, we don't know again that whole history, but uh, Honduras has been on, and Central America has been off the radar, I think, where, and there are very few. But, and again, this is an amazing story, I think, of having a biracial Japanese Mexican, two soldiers in the 442. Oh, amazing. I would love for somebody to make a. Uh, I would love to make a film about my uncle who was in the Philippines because one of the things that he's been interviewed many times. But um, when I guess there was some Japanese family living in the Philippines, and after the end of the war, that um, these kids would hide in these caves in the Philippines and they couldn't get them out. And my uncle, he remembered his father singing Japanese songs, these children's songs, and so my uncle would go. 
outside these caves and sing these songs. He, my uncle says, I, he says, I didn't know what they mean. And so I have a video of him singing these songs and I played it for the TV crew in, in Tokyo. And they go, oh yeah, yeah, that's a very famous Japanese song. My uncle has no idea, I mean, he, but, but, he, but he sang these songs in front of these caves and the kids came out. Wow. And, uh, and my uncle was always, he's that kind of person. But at the same time, when he talked about World War II, he says, oh man, those, my, those soldiers were so racist against the Filipinos. And, and he would, these brutal Which stories of what, the, yeah, the U.S. soldiers. The U.S. soldiers. Oh. Yeah, they're, they're so brutal. So, you know, they're, you know, again, we're not trying to be um, uh, uh, antagonistic against any group. But he says, you know, the, these soldiers, they, they'd be eating, watching the kids kind of, you know, look at waiting for them to finish with the food. And they'd take a bite and drop it on the floor and, they, and they'd smash it with their boot yeah. and then let the kids come and eat it up. And then they would just laugh. And, and, um, but, but at the same time, it was really interesting because my uncle, he, he loved the military. He'd wear his regalia. He'd always be in parades, the Japanese-American um, in Japantown. He'd be total Tokyo. He'd be on the, the, the convertible waving. He, he loved that. But I, 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 did, I never had a chance to really say, how did you fit those both? You know, they were so, you know, the military was so racist. But at the same time, gave him an opportunity, a poor kid in, from L.A., right? saw the world and was well at least i think i i hopefully you know it all of you who know about who you are maybe for some people it, it is important to know you know when you look in the mirror why do you have a face that you do why do people like as a teacher you know i i, I like i said I, I identify a lot with mexican culture latino culture but i have students who come up to me and they go teacher um says i, I know you're not mexican but you know why why is your name sosa you know <laughs> And so I'm always surprised, you know, because I don't know who, what I look like to other people and people will see something. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it helps too to all know all this because my daughter, because my wife is Taiwanese, so my daughter's, you know, a mix of, of all, all of what we are. And so, you know, she has she grew up in San Marcos and you know, lived in New York City. And so she's gotten so many comments about her look and that. Yeah, so, uh Knowing about who she is, I think it made her stronger too. By the way, um, you know, I had always, I had always heard that from Japan, the immigration was if you're from Eastern Japan, like Tokyo and Yokohama, you thought the land of opportunity was in Brazil, so you all went to Brazil. And then those of us in, you know, my relatives, my ancestors are from Hiroshima and Kagoshima, which is Western Japan. We all thought America was the land of opportunity, and it sounds like maybe people in Kumamoto thought that Mexico was the land of opportunity. Um, and so they went there. So it's interesting how we all went to different places. Yeah. I, I always um, thought it was so interesting. You know, we think of, um, well, back in the eighties when I was going to college that, you know, Japan was the land of opportunity, all the English teachers who, you know, as soon as you wanted to get, you know, graduated, everybody, let's go to Japan and make a lot of money. You know, that's where to, it was the odd idea that Japan, this wealthy country that we think of now, sending their children to Mexico, you know, with the visas that says agricultural worker. I go, wow, what is that? You know, and it's it's um, how cyclical um, history is, and yeah. how economic and wars can change. I had um, I had never heard the connection to the Russo-Japanese War. Like I didn't realize that that was one of the reasons why there was. Um, immigration to other parts of the, the world. I know that at least in my family's um, experience, I think there was a famine in Hiroshima, maybe in Kagoshima. And I think there was because of the famine or just the crops weren't very good or something. That's why they went to search for opportunities abroad. Interesting stuff. Yeah, it is. But yeah, the the way, Rus yeah. my grandfather was involved in the Russo-Japanese War and he was sort of smart. He, I think, or my, that's how he was. The story was told to me. Um, he raised his. Does anybody know how to cook? Was the question, and he went, "Yes," even though he didn't know how to cook. But that meant he wasn't going to be on the front lines. Mm. So um, he he ended up being a cook for the in that war. And after the war, he he immigrated to find his his opportunities in the United States. But I was I was under the impression that it was around 1910. But you from your timeline, you're saying that in 1908. People were not allowed to immigrate from Japan. Uh, emigrate from Japan. Right. Well, I, I maybe at least not to the U.S. 
Yeah, not they, to the, well, that's what he did around 1910 is what our family story is. No. So maybe, maybe no, maybe I think because that the gentleman's agreement was was informal. It didn't it didn't pass through Congress. So maybe your your uh, your relative was very um, savvy and knew how to get around, you know, the system. And you know, again, so many people who are who make it to the U.S. back at that time, they they had to be savvy. I see. Yeah. And I just think of my grandfather. He was 15. He learned Spanish. He learned how to write Spanish. He learned how to 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 speak English. So you know, he he wasn't going to ESL classes or you know Spanish as a second language classes. He was trying to live and picked it up because it is probably part of survival. Yeah. I had a couple of comments about your presentation. One, um, there I saw the word "eming" um, after. One of the words in Emin, I believe, means immigration. So it's not a name of somebody. It's, it just actually means immigration. I am, I am. Um, oh, thank you. The other one was, it had Shogun Ieyasu um, from the 17th century. That's Tokugawa, right? Where we talk about the Tokugawa shogunate. That was that, was that guy that I apparently in your presentation sent over in um, some kind of group to, uh, to say hello to Mexico. And I, I want to say I've seen a video um on youtube oh wow in my free time let me try to find that yeah but interesting history uh between japan and mexico um i, I was just remembering that there i don't know if you're familiar with the there's a japanese writer shusako endo that one of the books he wrote was called samurai and it was about um sending a samurai from japan to plead with the pope to allow trade in allow Japan trade and so he had to go from Japan and he, he he landed in Mexico and had to travel through Mexico get, get you know to the to the Gulf and then from there to go to Europe but uh, that was uh, an interesting kind of that was the first time I had read about that yeah apparently the Japanese sent people everywhere back in the 17th century <laughs> yeah I, I can't imagine traveling that, that back then yeah Um, so, um, is there, um, again, you know, I, I really appreciate, I, I, I gain from not really sharing, but hearing your comments is, you know, I, again, I don't know, you might have large groups of Asian friends. I have very few, um, um, I, except maybe in Asia, cause I lived for many years in Taiwan and also Hong Kong. So I have friends there, but it's not, they're not interested in Asian American history. They're, they're interested in their own lives. So here in the United States, I have very few Asian American friends. And so my family is not that interested in, in this kind of nitty gritty history. I am, um, I'm interested when, if it's the World Cup and Mexico plays Japan, who are you rooting for? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, right now I, I, I'm at Palomar College, I belong to two groups. One is a, a Latino group called ALAS, and one is Apahe, and um, we're going to be uh, marching in the Martin Luther King Parade on, in January. And uh, both groups have said, come and join us, <laughs> wear, wear your shirt. And, and, and so, um, and, you know, next Friday, both groups invited me for, you know, to get together. One is for La Posada, which is kind of the uh, Mexican kind of celebration of uh, uh, Christmas for when Ma when Mary and Joseph walked through the streets of Bethlehem, and the other the the, Apai, the Japanese American groups, yeah, come join us. And so, um, you know, I, I feel that I, I that's they're, they're both part of me, you know. And um, I wish I spoke Japanese better. I wish I spoke Spanish better. But I don't speak those languages. I spoke another. I spoke the language of my wife better than than uh, Japanese. So, just interesting. And and again, I find. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for having such a, a great group of people to belong to, at least to communicate with. I, I feel that I have a little part in your community now. Thank right, you. This is just the beginning, though, of, again, building that community. So, Gary, you know, uh, we'll, we'll look forward to other opportunities. Now we've got some connections with San Marcos and Palomar and North County. Have you ever been to Mexico yourself? Uh, to look for Japanese or to experience Japanese in Mexico? You know, not as I, I've been to Mexico several times as a young man um, in my 20s, and I spent 
several months there, um, more kind of discovering my Mexican roots and um, not as somebody looking for my Japanese roots. You know, again, you know, to do something like that, it is, I guess you really have to put some effort into it because when I do have free time, my family's wife, my, my family, uh, my wife's family is in Asia. So usually when I do have long stretches of time, time, yeah, I go, I'm going to say, I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to, which I, do I, that. I, I have to do really. But. Well, I was just surprised that one time my husband and I went to Mexico and this is, I think in the seventies and um, there we, we ended up at a Japanese restaurant. And um, we ended up, I ended up speaking to her mostly in Spanish to, get, to be able wow. to get my food. But uh, I think, you know, if, if you, as you drive around Mexico City, you would see like um, Hiroshima, uh, it could have been Sosa or Martinez Nursery. I mean, uh, there, there's a, you see a blend of names between yeah. the Japanese and the, and the Mexican culture. Uh, and I, I was asking at that time, how many Japanese are there? And you could see them in the streets, young people. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, they were, you know, just regular people. They weren't doing anything. They were just socializing. But right. uh, they said at that time in the 70s, there were 10,000. Oh, wow. wow, wow. 10,000 Japanese in and maybe mixed marriages by then, you know, but there were, there was a noticeable, to me, it was noticeable um, that there was a presence there. Well, in my retirement years, I got plenty to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Gary. Thank you, everyone, for You're your time and your questions and comments. And, and we'll look forward to uh, further opportunities to uh, get acquainted with each other. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Well, thank you all for coming tonight and thank you for your comments. It's helped really make the evening interesting for me. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays.